I listened to Hossein for three minutes and I'm already waiting for his presentation. Um, we have kind of like discussed what we call um, history 101 in, two, in, in one and a half hour. And I've burdened you with lots of details perhaps about history. Uh, but just to put things in perspective, it's important to understand sometimes the roots of certain things, how they evolve and where we are. Because um, as Charles just mentioned, there's something very interesting about the conceptual understanding today of our uh, discussion about race, about hatred, about otherness and so on in the context of the liberal state and in particular within our understanding of what we call multicultural societies. And it is quite remarkable in that respect that it is exactly in this era when we have seen the rise of anti-Semitism in liberal societies under the pretext of defending multiculturalism. This is quite remarkable. Which means that the progressive wings on the one hand, both in the United States, Corbinites in this country, and many other places, are adopting the language of anti-Semitism under the guise of attacking Israel. We do not attack Jews, but we attack Israel. Separating, separating between Israel supposedly and the Jewish people under the disguise or under the argument that Jews do not deserve to govern themselves because if they want to govern themselves, they want to be too powerful while we recognize them as powerless in the multicultural society. Confusing, but that's exactly it. You will find in the same manner anti-Semitism perhaps rising on the far right from a completely different perspective charging the Jewish people or Jews to be too universalists too soft on multiculturalists who are debunking what is America the way we envision it making America great again so either you're attacking the Jews for being too universal or you're attacking them for being what we call people with dual loyalty, too loyal to Israel. Which means that there is a large scope of basically dealing with issues pertaining to the liberal society by addressing the Jews by using the Jews as kind of like a code word. For example, attacking George Soros. George Soros is a universalist. So there is kind of like the capitalist market. Here is the Jews who have no commitment to local issues. So who is attacking? Those who are on the left attacking those George Soros people money. Jews are money. So George Soros represents money, even though he donates only to liberal causes, but that's a different story. So they attack George Soros, and George Soros is becoming the nemesis of Israel in the minds and hearts of the Israeli nationalists. You know, like he, he debunks Israeli nationalism because of that. It's very confusing, but you can attack the Jewish cause, whatever it means, both on the left and on the right for too much loyalty to the tribe or too much loyalty to universal causes at the expense of our nation, the American nation, the French nation, the German nation, etc. This has been throughout modernity. In that respect, anti-Semitism captures the entire gamut. And then, of course, you have the old anti-Semitism that comes with Islamic radicalism. Islamic radicalism articulates a blunt notion of the Jews as a debased people, 
that's supposed to be killed. This is the radical Islamism. These are the people of evil. These are the people that we suppose basically to, de to, to, to debunk and demise. Now, all of this language, as I said, meet the Jewish people in a very interesting juncture. On the one hand, they have a powerful state. Powerful in the sense that it is growing, prospering. Its economics is doing very well. Its people are doing quite well. It's growing population-wise. Israel is the fastest growing population in the West. In the OECD, the fertility rates of Israeli women is quite remarkable, 3.14. The family structure keeps Israel such a powerful, growing nation. And it also meets the Jewish people in the diaspora, seeing themselves more and more integrating into their societies overall, question of assimilation and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, meeting, for example, in Europe, the challenge of new Europe, with growing Islamic communities. As Dominique Schnapper, the, the philosopher, tells me, there is no longer a Jewish question in Europe, but there is an, an Islamic question in Europe, how Europe will look like. Or in England with Corbyn, what Corbyn have with the Jews? Yeah, how many Jews? 300,000 uh, British Jews. Why, why is it such a big issue? Why the Labour Party is imploding with the question of anti-Semitism, people of the Labour Party are leaving? Because it's almost symbolic to see which issue is debunking the idea of the right wing, which issue resonates with the progressives. Hating Israel became kind of like almost a symbol for doing right for the progressive. I want to explain all of this in the next hour and so. Really to see where we are. It's not so simple to understand sometimes. It's even confusing for many. You look at the news and you see Congresswoman Omar attacking Trump, attacking this, Trump attacking back, and suddenly people ask me, yesterday I gave interview to Social Press, New York Times, why, how the Jews have been interjected to all of this? Why, why is it? Is there a debate in America between Trump and the left and so on? Why the Jews are suddenly kind of playing the role? For a variety of reasons, as we will see. Let me begin by saying that, and that the condition, or what we call the Jewish condition, in the West, of course, was such in the late 19th century that people thought that the Western civilization somehow will solve the issue of the Jewish condition, unattainable Jewish condition, in Eastern Europe and Western Europe in America. America was the promised land. Just as America was supposed to be the promised land, even for slaves eventually. Emancipation, the rise of American, African American, the rise to power eventually, supposed to make America a home for everybody. America is the dream home for everybody when there are no minorities, rather there is a multicultural society. Creating a society, a nation of all nations. And the Jewish people jumped on the opportunity, as I suggest. Especially after they found out that there is no really prospect in modernity for other places. Sovereignty and the creation of an independent state was not a solution yet. It was a late solution. For the vast majority of East European Jews in the Russian emperor, uh, Empire, America was, of course, the solution after they suddenly suffered from pogroms in 1880-81, uh, 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 after the assassination of the Tsar, Alexander II. Massive migration to the United States. Massive. Two and a half million, in fact, from 81 to 1914. By 1997, New York, the New York City became a Jewish city. And America was supposed to deliver the promise because America 
even though it was created by the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, but it was changing its nature to become a land of the free. Everybody could be a citizen of the United States and claim ownership. Canada in a different fashion, Australia, but a different fashion. European Jews who felt that that may be the case in France and in Germany woke up to the realities that that will never be the case. In East European, anti-Semitism was still manifesting itself in the old type of anti-Semitism, the Christian type of anti-Semitism, the Russian church, etc., etc. In Western Europe, especially in Germany, and of course in France later on, the Jews were the significant minority other threatening us. Despite huge efforts of the Jews to integrate into Germany and despite the Emancipation Proclamations, the Emancipation Proclamation, which was first in 1789, in Germany it changed, as you very well know, even though Germany was supposedly accepting emancipation, but it was accepting emancipation initially just because Napoleon imposed it on Germany. When Napoleon retreated, it took Germany a lot of time to reinstate emancipation. The Jews in Germany felt that Germany is the home. They were trying to create the theology, the Judaism itself in part and parcel of Protestant Germany. They were eager to join the German army to shed blood for the nation because shedding blood for the nation gives you access to the nation. Shared blood and shed blood, remember that. It's a different story. When you shed blood, you're supposedly loyal to the nation. When Hitler came to power, Jews submitted to him a book with statistics showing him how Jews basically died in World War I much more than any other segment of the German population as a way of showing total loyalty to the nation. Developed all the theology for Germany, becoming the quintessential Germans. But of course the Nazi Germany did not accept the idea of loyalty of that nature because loyalty became identified with race. Anti-Semitism morphed into racism. It was already like that was Fichte in the 19th century but it became official. So Germany was not in any fashion a solution. It took time for the Jews to realize that. Until Europe became a graveyard of anti-Semitism. Herzl warned about it in a different fashion, didn't understand how calamity will hit. The United States, on the other hand, was supposed to be the salvation. Zionists, however, believed that there is no salvation just in the United States. We must have a home of our own in order to solve the issue of anti-Semitism. When Herzl went to leaders of the world to ask for sovereignty for the Jews, he told them, we're going to solve your problem, not our own. You're going to get rid of us. You should be happy about it. Give us a home. What happened is, when Israel was created, there was an imbalance among the Jews after the Holocaust. One was a very small sovereign state of 680,000 people. And of course, there were about another 11 million people still in other countries, majority of whom were now in the United States, in Canada, and some who were still left in Europe, and many in the Arab states in the Muslim states, what we call Mizrahi Jews. The creation of the State of Israel and the centrality of statehood became an outcry for lots of issues in the world, for example. Jews were immediately, were questions, where, where is their home? Is your home in Palestine or is your home in our midst? For example, for example, Jews in the Arab world were very quickly became entangled in the struggle between Israel in the Arab world in the War of Israel of Independence in 1948. 700,000 of them had to move as refugees because they were attacked 
as potential loyalists of the new state of Israel or claimed loyalists. In the Soviet Union, Jews were immediately subjected to even more viral anti-Semitism, this time as charged as loyalists to Zionism. Prior to that, they were charged just as traitors for all the causes you want. So anti-Semitism became also for Zionism the vehicle for bringing people into Palestine. We are in Israel perceived, we perceived Jews under duress as the manna from heaven. They are the new immigrants. They will come and will reside in the state. The state is open for any Jew, notwithstanding whether he has halachic credentials. Maybe he's real Jew or not Jew, who he was born, because if the Nazi does not distinguish what is Jewish, his mother is Jewish or his father is Jewish, we will not distinguish also. Everybody, the, the land is open. The land is open and it's also a vehicle for settling the land as a security issue. Anti-Semitism was perceived in, men, in the minds of some Zionists as a way of saying, I told you so, come here, reside here, this is your home. Here you can claim home without any reservation. In the West, of course, Anti-Semitism became unfashionable after World War I, after World War II. You felt uncomfortable. So in the United States, you had very quickly a drive for greater integration. If the United States still saw Jews, if you look at 19, in the, in the eve of World War I, Jews wanted to integrate. The reform movement just wanted, you know, they, they, they just didn't want to be Jewish at all. But the people kept Jewish clubs. I mean, they, they kept Christian clubs. They didn't integrate them. You could not be professor in universities. You read Dan Oren's book, Joining the Club. You could not be. And Jews were driving themselves into, now it's an opportunity after World War II. Because it was unfashionable. America was immediately was engulfed in a war of course, of its own, a kind of a semi-civil war with, of course, African-American trying to integrate after World War II as well. The whole second black emancipation came after World War II. Because how could it be that we fought against Nazism and fascism in Europe and still have the enslavement or, or, or Jim Crow laws in America? So there were two levels here of, of, of fighting. The Jews joining the blacks in the fight against for emancipation in America, but also seeing what Israel is, and there were lots of tension emerging. Interesting enough. This tension were manipulated oftentimes. Because who do you claim loyalty to? To our own, to the new Jewish state, how much it can happen. And this was a very big time of also a rift between African-American and Jewish-American, but also a huge alliance between Martin Luther King, for example, and Malcolm X, two different schools of thoughts. The churches were divided. In the Soviet Union, of course, the Jews were, became completely hostage as a result of the Israeli creation. Hostage in the sense that they are a minority, suspect minority, with short trials of doctors, all kind of stories about the old stories about Jews poisoning, etc., etc. All the, all the stories of Christianity were superimposed in socialism. Anti-Semitism morphed in a different fashion, as I said. It was an indication of geopolitical rift as well. The fact that Israel chose to be with America in the Korean War made a shift in the policy of Stalin also vis-a-vis -vis the Jews, etc., etc. And, and, and the borders were closed. Now, in France, for example, the Jews had to understand their new life as well. Keep in mind, France betrayed itself more than anything else when it turned the Jews to the Nazis. 
when France was occupied, the Vichy government broke the oath of emancipation and basically lowered the Jews to people who are not citizens and turned 80,000 of them to the Nazis for Auschwitz. To some French people until today, and when it was exposed and it was not talked about until the 70s when Paxton wrote his book, it was not talked. I write a lot about it. This was a mega terror against the Jews that basically broke France's idea of emancipation. When I visited France and I went to see uh, uh, the Klarsfelds, the Nazi hunters, and he documented, I have all the pictures, he documented the deportation of his father and all the 80,000. This was a huge trauma. How could France, our land, could do that? So there were geopolitical circumstances that changed the mindset of this issue constantly. Israel, as I said in my early remarks, did not address the issue of anti-Semitism in any fashion early on. It was completely preoccupied with sustaining and embellishing its own status as a state. A very small state, threatened by all sides of the Arab world. Annihilation was the word which was used in the Middle East. So, and no one trusted also in the West that this entity will survive this hostile Middle East. So obviously, regardless of the support given by the diaspora to the Jewish state, the fear was always that this is a temporary experiment. Because in any case, we have the history lessons that the first temple collapsed, the second temple collapsed, Bar Kokhva collapsed, now Israel will collapse. Everybody was speaking about the destruction of the third temple. This was exactly the language on the eve of the 67 war, the six day war. The 67 war, I grew up then, I was 11 years old, I was born in 1956, so you know how old I am. We dug graves in preparation for the calamity that become. And the world was watching. And Ramon said, I don't know if I want to live after that, when the Gaul said these Jews are whatever, arrogant. And the huge victory that came in six days of Israel basically destroying the entire Arab armies in a preemptive strike, changed the entire mindset and the entire language of anti-Semitism and, and Jewish power. From total powerlessness to something of a mighty powerful question. The Jew himself was suddenly perceived as powerful and not this victim what they call Yenid Shnebech, this weakling Jew. Suddenly, he is the winner. How could it be? And a big winner, defeating the Egyptian army, the, the Iraqi army, the Syrian army, conquering all this land. A huge transformation among world Jews, an explosion of messianic kind of perceptions. Something else happened. A return to history, even more than the creation of the state itself. The language of anti-Semitism ever since will change from the idea of the weak, of the Holocaust, etc., to this powerful nation. The language of colonialism, the language of power, the language of occupation, all of those languages that came to be associated with the new anti-Semitism. One should not even underestimate this transformation. First of all, it transformed many Jewish communities around the world. Suddenly they could be proud of the sovereign entity. They didn't have to be apologetic about it. Especially in the United States. They understood that they could draw sustenance and identity from it. 
And this type of sustenance and identity and closeness will come to be identified as dual loyalty. How could you be so close to Israel, how much it comes at the expense of America? This debate began already in earnest in the late 60s. Will become even more heightened in the 70s and 80s. And as of later on, it becomes a huge issue with the Palestinian, and as you learn about the BDS, sort of a, how can you support Israel? You are against the values of modernity. And who speaks on behalf of the values of modernity and human rights? All those who debunk values of modernity and human rights in the Middle East and elsewhere. Quite amazing. But go explain it on college campuses or go explain it to people who really don't have the picture altogether. It's very confusing. Because you always like to see the powerful as someone who is illegitimate vis-a-vis -vis those who are being portrayed as powerless. This gave, this gave uh, a justification for terrorism. This gave justification for global terrorism in the 70s, gave justification for the PLO terrorism in the 1970s, in the Munich, in, in Antebe, in many places. As if this terrorism against the Jews is legitimate because they are powerful, suddenly. And it also gave virulent anti-Semitism legitimacy in other places, attacking Jews as the soft belly of the state of Israel. Suddenly Jews, wherever they may be, were target of because they are associated with Israel. Notwithstanding whether they're associated or not, that's what happened. Anti-Semitism was again dwarfing into part of the global world between third world and second world, the East European and the West. We see, therefore, that anti-Semitism is a phenomena which is definitely attached to the global developments and to politics in many Western countries and, of course, in terms of the position of the Western civilization versus other civilizations. The issue of the Palestinians became suddenly entangled in everything which was done in the international scene. No other issue dominated the international scene as the Palestinians in any fashion. The fact that Israel was condemned in the United Nations ten times more than any other country altogether on the issue of Palestinians was part of this kind of alliance against Israel which became sort of the nemesis of the international system for Islamic states, for the Arab states, for third world countries who identified Israel as friend of America eventually. But as I suggested to you early on, the Israeli state evolved not by ignoring it altogether, but basically developing a creed. In any case, they hate us, so let's move on. Let's move on. Because you know what's the Jewish legacy. All the Jewish holidays are, they tried to kill us, somehow we survived, let's go and eat now. Exactly. <laughs> that's Purim, that's Passover, it's Hanukkah, somehow we have survived, right? So, in any case, there is a story out there to be told. But this is not a matter of serendipity now. This is a matter of really sovereignty. This is a matter of sovereignty, of growing sovereignty, and this is also a matter of a division of labor between the Jews in the diaspora and the Jews of the state of Israel. What their vision? Do they have different vision? One is a sovereign vision, the other is people who are residing in their countries of citizenship, who they are belonging to, loyalty, lobbies, etc., etc. Completely different discourse. And as I said, then of course there is the Islamic radical discourse, which is unapologetic about the hate, kind of like blunt. The discussion, therefore, became also entangled with the modern liberal state. The modern liberal state 
supposed to deliver rights to its citizens, supposed to deliver respect for cultures, supposed to give recognition for difference. The Jewish issue was always a cue in that respect. How you treat the Jews? In the British case, of course, they did not know any minority but the Irish minority. The Jews were the second minority. Irish minorities they knew what to do with because they had land. But the Jews was a different story. When the Balfour Declaration came to be exactly 103 years ago, two years ago, many Jews in this country was livid. They were leery about it. Because we are not a nation, we are British people. If you say there is a homeland elsewhere, it means that we have to go there. They were afraid of that. How could you designate us as others? How could you suddenly say homeland for the Jews? We are here. Britain is our homeland. American Jews, of course, always said that they are not a nation. The reform movement in America declared in the 1885 Pittsburgh Agreement that we are not a nation, we don't claim homeland. We are Americans, we are Jewish religion, and we are not even halachic religion. There is part of what we call the Americanization of religion. We are part and parcel of America. They refuse even to recognize the state of Israel. Remember, American Jewish Committee, which fights today against anti-Semitism all over the world, was anti-Zionist. The reform movement were anti-Zionists. Fearing that being Zionists will label them as dual loyalty, doing everything in their power just to not be somewhat associated with people who want sovereignty. Only after sovereignty was enshrined, and only after the state created and became powerful in the 67 war, people suddenly started to hail it and say, okay, now we can speak with our head high. We can speak and see that we can be proud of a state. But this is not only proud, because the state also have issues. Have issues where there will be a Palestinian state, not a Palestinian state, and you constantly find yourself in the bind. Should I apologize for Israel behaving in a sovereign manner that not giving the Palestinian rights? Should I apologize for the first intifada? Should I do, what should I do? How should I handle myself? When Bainar writes, I will check my Zionism at the door of liberalism, that if Zionism will become aggressive, I will choose liberalism, I write back to him and I say, what remains of your Judaism? What does it mean you have to make a choice? Why you have to make a choice? Why you constantly judge us as harsher as possible? Because you want to feel comfortable as a universalist, while Israel is very particularist. It's a very tough situation, internally speaking. Until you suddenly feel that notwithstanding your position in America, whether you are liberal or conservative, you are being attacked. Suddenly you feel under duress. If you are too liberal, you are attacked for being too universalist and not nationalist enough. If you are too conservative, you are attacked by the liberal for being too tribal. Very confusing. Israel, as I said, did not understand this issue of the diaspora for many years. The Israeli state did not address diaspora concerns. They addressed only sovereign concerns. When Begin signed an agreement with Anwar Sadat on a peace agreement in 1978-79 between Egypt and Israel, the head of the ADL Anti-Defamation League in America came to Begin and told him, you know, we have to fight for this anti-Semitism in Egypt. We're going to hear in Egypt, viral anti-Semitism, hatred of the Jews. How can you sign deal with them? Begin said, we sign deal with Egypt state to state. Anti-Semitism will work itself out. It's the issue of the diaspora. When in 2001, all the world is assembling a Durban, in South Africa. This is after September 11, attacking only Israel as violator of human rights. Israel want to send a minister. The diaspora said, don't send a minister. It's our issue. Anti-Semitism is not an Israeli issue. It's diaspora issue. You're a state. 
this becomes a very interesting division between the sovereign state and the Jewish people. Who speaks on behalf of the Jews? With what authority? And who listens? Very important question. Which organization? Anti-Semitism also became synonymous with other struggles as I described in the world. People started to argue, and that was a big kind of like rift in anti-Semitism, that the Jews are claim to victimhood in the Holocaust and others already exhausted itself. They're not victims. Israel is a state. They are basically blowing up what happened in the Holocaust. Holocaust deniers became a huge school of thought at the expense of Israel's sovereignty, arguing that Israel is so powerful, supposedly it itself perpetuates the Holocaust of the Palestinians. Language has been inflated, language has been poisoned to the point of hating the Jews as if the Jews are committing crimes against humanity. And this became kind of like viral. The idea of anti-Semitism became so viral in the sense that Jews were becoming suddenly the villains. The idea of reversing history and reversing memory. Superimposing the Holocaust as if Israel is perpetuating it. Which is unbelievable, but that's how it happened. And that gave additional legitimacy to claims to destroy the Jews altogether, including like in Iran. We're supposed to destroy them. We're supposed to kill them all. Anti-Semitism became a type of geopolitics until the Israeli state understood it. Official of Israeli state understood it. It took them time. The playing with memory and collective memory is a very important idea in understanding the question of anti-Semitism. Who controls memory? Who defines it? Who defines the memory of evil? Who defines the memory of future consequences? How memory and the fight over memory becomes very important. When the Palestinians de describe their own what they call disaster, the fall in the Nakba. Nakba is the disaster that befell on them when the state of Israel was created. They suddenly started to compare it to the Holocaust. Language was used in that terms. And this was regarded, and for good reason, as completely anti-Semitism, because it gave legitimacy for the destruction of the Jews. When the Third World was engulfed in the 70s and 80s, in a war between the West and the uh, 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 developing country, Palestinian struggle was injected into this language of the Third World. Don't forget that Gamal Abdel Nasser, the man who basically was the, uh, 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 I would say, the most charismatic leader of Egypt and the charismatic leader of the Third World, was the leader of the African Unity Organization. So the struggle against Israel and the struggle against Israel's sovereignty became the struggle of those people who are fighting colonialism. Another language was superimposed on the conditions. Israel is an outpost of colonialists. Who are the colonialists? Who knows? But they're outposts of colonialists. And every Jew supported them is an outpost of colonialists. Attacks were therefore becoming more and more legitimate to attack the Jews wherever they are because of their direct or indirect relations with Israel. This was the attacks in Europe in the 70s. These were the attacks eventually in Argentina, in Amia. These were attacks on remnants of Arab Jews in, in Syria, in Iran, everywhere. Anti-Semitism and the Jewish idea, the Jewish sort of like affinity with Israel became justification for the new anti-Semitism.
the struggle against anti-Semitism, initially in the Western world, was a struggle for greater inclusion of all groups. Remember, when Jewish Americans started to build their large institutions in the late 19th century, they built the Bnei B'rith, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, all of these organizations were for integration of all groups. Jews always wanted to include all groups with them as part of conquering the liberal creed in America. They were universal, showing themselves never to be just defending themselves. But eventually, when these groups becoming more and more attached to Israel, they suddenly become suspect of too much attachment to Israel. And therefore, they are very sensitive to it. If you attended the conference like I did last June in Washington of the American Jewish Committee, the entire conference was dedicated to the struggle against anti-Semitism. You have been there? Yeah, I was there. Yep. You saw people from Britain coming, you saw Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter. You saw an Iraqi dissident. They understand. This is a unified issue. It is not about Israel. It's about us and it's about the world. These world Jewish organizations trying to create this universal claim. Oftentimes running into tension perhaps with the state of Israel. Because these are different types of needs. One is the need to understand our communities, be it in Pittsburgh or in California being attacked, and how you address this issue in America, and how you address this issue in France, and how you address this issue in England, and this is a different story. But to separate the case of Israel from the case of world Jews is also very superficial, as if they have different needs, as if these are different types of threats. Because in the minds and hearts of the nemesis of the Jews, they also always hold them the same. They never separate between Israeli Jews and diaspora Jews, just as they don't separate between ultra-Orthodox Jews, secular Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, Mizrahi Jews. They don't. They don't understand the, the subtleties of this. The Jews is sort of like an expression of the significant or the insignificant other. You have to understand it when you do it. It's complicated. We are now at a very interesting juncture, in my opinion, that is leading us to lots of uh, thoughts and uh, I would say uh, one has to be honest where we are, really, where we are in terms of like, the condition of the Jews. On the one hand, I would argue here, without reservation, that the Jewish condition was never, ever better than it is now. Primarily because there is a very strong Jewish state. As I suggested early on in my comments, the vast majority of the Jews soon will reside in a sovereign state. That's in itself a revolution. Jews in the world are not subject to massive killing anywhere. One should, you know, say, oh, this is great. Yeah, it's great. Israel is they take on Halimi. Man should not take lightly what's happening in England. But they are no longer kind of like attacks on Jews with impunity. They're not attacks which are sanctioned, most in cases, from above. Rather condemned. When the Prime Minister of France said, if you leave the Jews, France will collapse, he means it. Even in England. I'm not saying you don't have a big issue here. I don't know how many people from England are here because most people here are coming from different places. But even in England. People understand, and Theresa May expressed 
uh, herself in no uncertain terms. And so David Cameron in the past and other members of the labor who just left. You cannot sanction this. And if you do, you know, and you see for the first time the Jewish Chronicle and all the papers here united and saying we are in danger in, in, in England. And indeed, British Jews have been leaving and are thinking about leaving. But there is no imminent danger. And if, indeed, Israel also, one you have to understand, Israel took upon itself, I don't know if you know it or not, Israel took upon itself as a matter of law. Chapter 13 in the Israeli Penal Code declares, and this is the quote, and if I remember it correctly, if not, you excuse me, because, but more or less, that Israel is responsible for the well-being of Jew wherever he may, she may be, if they are attacked as Jews. Extrajudicial law. You cannot attack a Jew because he's Jewish and think that Israel will not get back to you. Interesting. So Israel is sending whatever it is, I don't know if you know it, but it's not a secret anymore. It's sending its Mossad operators, whatever it is, to defend synagogues and other places if they are being attacked. Don't think that we will sit in a sovereign state of Israel and think the Jews were attacked because they're Jewish. We have a responsibility. We are the Jewish state. Interesting. It doesn't mean they can defend the Jews wherever they are because they are still citizens of America, citizens of England, but nevertheless they have a claim like that. Other countries have taken same claims about their own diasporas. When Korean Americans were attacked in 1992 in the LA riots, remember that? Korea said, we're going to come and defend you. Kim Do Young, sort of like at the time, yes. There's like a question, what is your responsibility? Is that your extended family? Is the Jews an extended family or they are related just by chance? A big question that's being asked. The fact is also that as a result of anti-Semitism, many French Jews also left, started to come to Israel. They created what they call Boeing Aliyah. One step in Netanya in Tel Aviv, the other in Toulouse. They come back and forth. Some people said this is the reason why real estate is so expensive in Israel. Because everybody buying for the sake of maybe I will need it. As a safe haven. In the case of the United States, which is the largest case, of course, Jews always, always stressed that America is different because America basically wiped out anti-Semitism. In any case, America had other different cold challenges. Above all, racism. The condition of African American was much harsher in America than of Jews, of course. Of slavery, the legacy of slavery, the legacy of racism, so embedded in the legacy of the United States. Therefore, there is a tragedy of sorts whenever there is kind of a debate between African American and Jewish American on this issue rather than unity. And this issue is becoming more and more intense in the case of the internal debate in America if people don't understand the context, how it's being used and misused. It is not by mistake that you see on campuses around the United States that BDS activists, boycott, divestment, sanction activists, trying to separate Jewish Americans from African Americans in a sense of sort of creating a rift. As if, if you are sort of like supporting Israel, you cannot be friends of the, uh, uh, the, the, the progressive wing, which is of course ridiculous because look at who is the progressive wing in America. American Jews, remember, on vast elections, 80% vote for Democrats. They are 80% liberals. The American left, to begin with, was always Jewish. What is left in America if not Jewish? What is left in America if not Jewish? From the time they came, all the, all the left came, all the bund and, 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 and what is known in the, the past, the American left in the working force and Lazarus, etc. It all came from the Soviet, from Russia. They were the progressive voices. Who do you think is Bernie Sanders? And yet, the language there is becoming intense and viral. And one has to keep in, keep in mind that this is becoming, it's manipulated in my opinion. Without going into discussion of a serious discussion on issues. And the reason is because there's such enmity in America. 
between the forces of the right and forces of the left. So the Jews are interjected in between. It's very easy on the left to hate the Jew who is supposedly related to Israel, who is supported by Trump, than rather to hate Trump directly. You hate Trump directly also, but it's easy to say, you know, it's the Jewish voices. And vice versa. It's very easy to uh, hate the Jews on the right, or the liberal Jews, because they supposedly debunk Trump rather than deal with other issues. And in between, you have new alliances. Evangelicals, friends of Israel, others, and so on. The context has to be understood. So in any case, the Jews are being injected or interjected or whatever you want to say into this kind of debate. And anti-Semitism is sometime on the rise. And when you have violent attack, it's kind of exploding. In any context, if you look at last week, sort of like development, when Congresswoman, um, what's her name? Omar or, or the other lady? Uh, Yes. Um, uh, so when, when she articulates this kind of like uh, issues against Israel and against the power of Israel on the hill and so on, liberal Jews are on the defensive. What do you mean? You know, how can we dare? You know, if they will say something about her, they're racists. So they have to be, but, they, but how she could speak about us like that? And then Trump intervenes and Trump understands the, the game. So they have to defend her and be against her for what she says about them. And she can build herself like that beautifully. Politics. The politics of otherness is certainly interjecting Jews into it. And anti-Semitism is constantly there. And why is it? It's because notwithstanding their positions in the countries of domicile, the big issue of the Jews was always whether they can claim the place of citizenship, their real home, I argue. In Israel, everybody claims home. It is my home. When you fly in El Al in Israel, the big commercial is Achi Babayit Ba'olam. This is the greatest place of home you travel. You'll be a black Jew, white Jew, Sephardic Jew. Everybody claims home. And they fight in the streets of Israel tooth and nail for the place in the home. French Jews suddenly wake up and say, wow, we have been here generations. Vlan said it's our home, but how come others suddenly start to challenge it's our home? To the point that even American Jews, you can start to challenge whether it's their home and they, they feel outraged by it. Challenging the fact that Jews have a home in other countries is absolutely anti-Semitic. It's basically making the case that they do not have a home here. This always has been the case in Eastern Europe. Still, no Eastern European country Look at Jews as if it's their home. French Jews don't think that this is their home because the French tell them it's not. When the Israeli ambassador is brought, and I was there, to meet Jewish French Jews, Israel ambassador, the mayor of the place said, I brought you your ambassador. So what do you mean your ambassador? He's the ambassador of Israel. We are French. We live in Toulouse. When I'm in Argentina, and they, they, you have an event of Jewish Argentines, and there is like an event, they said, the Israeli, your ambassador, means you, that you're Argentines, you serve in Israel, but you are, sometimes we, maybe you do not belong. Israel is becoming sort of like the, the essence of, kind of like the test, even though by definition, they kind of challenge their wholeness. This is one of the biggest challenge of diaspora Jews today. Whether they can claim home without being challenged that this is their home, in my opinion. This is the, this is the new anti-Semitism that relates to Israel, but relates also to the idea of your claim of home that is in the Western world. What was perceived to be a fait accompli, something which was settled, as if there is no question about it. Apparently, there is a question, and that makes the claim of Zionism even stronger. Because, say, we told you so. Obviously, in Russia, they already moved. In Ukraine, they are moving. In all the Arab countries, they are moving. In South Africa, they are moving. 
how could they claim home if people challenge that this is their home? So to make yourself a home, you have basically assimilate and hide your Jewishness. If you hide your Jewishness, an anti-Semitism doesn't catch you. Unless eventually it will become racism again and that will catch you again. But that is not the intention of multiculturalism and the liberal state. Liberal state and multiculturalism was supposed to celebrate your identity, was supposed to accentuate your identity. You want to be community. You want to see, I don't have to apologize for it. On the contrary, this is my home and my home is pluralist. Who invented the very idea of America as a pluralist nation? Horace Kellen, a Jewish thinker. El plurum unum, out of many one, the legacy of the United States. When you think about minorities and we think about racism, therefore, think about the Jewish case as an excellent plar, as a case to be reckoned with. Today, there are about 7 million Jews around the world outside of the state of Israel, maybe 7.5 million, depends how you count. There is a battle out there for making themselves feel comfortable, for feeling that this is their home. The state of Israel sometimes is not sensitive enough to their condition because out of the conceptual understanding that Israel is the home, they don't pay attention when these Jews are attacked by saying, wow, this is not a right. But sometimes I say, you know, I told you so, so come here. I'm telling you, this is the mentalité. Especially if these Jews are too liberal and kind of like thinking kumbaya society and everything is so, so as well, you know, Israeli nationalists are always pointing, you know, uh, didn't we tell you it's about time to move? I mean, triumphant stupidity of the Israelis. At the same time, there is triumphant timidity of diaspora Jews who, when attacked because of Israel, take a step back rather than take a very active action to debunk that. They are too much apologetic. Whenever Israel is now, you know, what we have in Gaza, we have to apologize. No. You have to do certain things with reality check. And reality check means that you don't apologize, you look at issues, you debate, you're part of the voice of the Jewish people. And for observers from the outside who claim to defend the rights of others, be it African American, be it Hispanic, be it Indian, whatever they are, they have really to understand when whenever there is kind of an attack of the Jews because of home or because of affinity, they are the next target, undoubtedly. You cannot think that you can compromise the Jewish voices while, he, while, while asking that yours will be heard. It doesn't work. I've been studying Arab Americans, I wrote a monograph about them. I've been studying Indian Americans. I've been studying African Americans' relation with the Jews. I wrote books, you can read them, I don't want you to read so much because you'll be confused more. <laughs> but it's clear to me that this is a big cue. It's a big testing sort of case to be examining of anti-Semitism. Let me conclude by saying we have come a long way from ancient Judaism, which was a tribe and a nation, which became dispersed. And its dispersion was seen as a curse and to some as a blessing of universalism and halachic life. Many people thought that living without sovereignty brings prosperity and cultural growth and even innovation. As Dubnov, who I mentioned, wrote, the Jews are the quintessential diasporic nation. They bring light into the nations because they bring new morality. Morality that doesn't need power. That's what they wrote about. 
In the era of globalization, the era of borderless people, the Jews were supposed to be the quaint essential example how you can prosper and be agile. Yuri Sleskin wrote in his book, The Jewish Century, that the Jews of the United States are the greatest achievement of modernity. They are the most flexible, they are the most innovative, and they are the most creative people in the world, and therefore the most successful. I maintain that only because sovereignty and the place of home, you can become agile, flexible, and successful. It is not by mistake that the startup nation begins in Tel Aviv, that Israelis travel the world and become prosperous all over the world and travel and see themselves as universal and still claim home and be certain about it without being so susceptible to, to, to anti-Semitism. They fight it. They speak about it. It doesn't mean that you have to have all the Jews in the sovereign state of Israel. Not, I didn't say that. But once you have a duality of a diaspora people and a sovereign people understanding that people who didn't include both sovereignty and dispersion, and you still have a claim of home, that kind of empowers you against any charges of otherness and any charges that bring malign kind of like designation of you, including, of course, hurting you violently. In that respect, I think we have come full circle. We have come a long way. And not to say that we don't have to be concerned about what's happening in the world, and I'm concerned always because as a Jewish trait you have to be concerned, otherwise you are not Jewish. But I think you also have to think how successful this era has been of creating a strong sovereignty and creating a reality check and also speaking up your mind. When, when the Holocaust took place, American Jews stayed on the sidelines. Wyman wrote the book, The Abandonment of the Jews. Anyone has to read it. How they were afraid that they will speak about their brothers and sisters being exterminated in gas chambers in, in Europe. They may be stigmatized in America for taking America into places America shouldn't want to be because America fight its own wars. The Israeli creed is never again. It's a creed that says, not arrogance of power, but realization that if you want to be really alert to such hate, you have to be ready also to react. If you are attacked, you have to have the ammunition to understand where it comes from. You have to answer intellectually. You have to respond aggressively. And I think this is where the struggle for anti-Semitism should be today. Thank you so much for listening. Any, Any questions? Question? Yes, yes, sir. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I found it very interesting the way you brought up kind of the fine line of Jews in the diaspora recognizing Israel as another home, but also kind of getting stigmatized as not necessarily being part of the nation in which they dwell. So my question, I'm kind of curious how you think that reflects some of the early like Eastern Hospital or cultural Zionist Sorry, I, I can't, I, maybe, um, yeah. I'm just curious how you think that affects kind of, uh, or reflects kind of the vision that a lot of Eastern Hospital and cultural Zionists, um, like Akal Ha'am, had the vision of kind of a cultural center where yes. Jews from the diaspora would be able to kind of relate their Judaism. Brilliant, Brilliant question. question. What's your name? Noah. Noah. Noah asked the question. I, I don't know if, if everybody knows what you're talking about, but I'll try to simplify it. Noah was asking me about this transformation that the Jews underwent from the time of the 18th century. To what extent they are a religious tribe or members of the modern state, beginning with Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was the first one who was contended with this question in the concept of Germany and Immanuel Kant. To what extent you can re retain Jewish orthodoxy as a tribal and not being integrated into the Western society. The Jews have basically moved into integration into Western society. And this was their creed, integration. And yet, the question was, how do we maintain it? In the late 19th century, when pogroms in Russia and Zionism started to move, there was two alternative responses. 
The one is the major response, America. The other was Zionism trickles into Palestine. There were those who thought, including Echad Am, that we are not ready for a sovereign state because we will not be able to create it. But what is important for us is to maintain cultural Judaism in a sovereign place. Otherwise, we will be assimilated in a liberal state. And he supported it. He even supported it with intellectuals who created Hebrew University. The architect of Hebrew University, Brit Shalom, said, we will create autonomous Jewish with the Arabs. No one will attack us because we will do it. This, of course, was proven wrong. Not was proven wrong theoretically, but actually the Arab attacks with vengeance did not accept any Jew in Palestine, wanted to wipe them out. So cultural Zionism became a theory, but in reality, actual Zionism or pragmatic Zionism or Ben Gurion was the issue, how do we secure our life? In today's world, people still ask this question of the past. To what extent Jewish culture supposed to be the one that informs Israel or sovereignty and power is the number one issue? De facto, you're absolutely correct, Israelis don't ask questions about Judaism. They know nothing about it mostly. They go to the beach on holidays. They celebrate as civic religion the holidays. They, are, they have vacation on Passover and Rosh Hashanah, but they, they know a little bit. And the big question about Israel is who controls the culture? The ultra-Orthodox, the religious Zionists, the secularists. How do you create this amalgamation of cultures between particularist culture of nationalism, religion, or universalism? The fact that Tel Aviv is the largest gay parade in the world, they say, is nemesis to the ultra-Orthodox. Right? How do you reconcile it? This is part and parcel of what we call the Israeli Kulturkampf, the culture war inside Israel. But this is for another lecture, and Charles pays very little about these lectures. <laughs> Charles, don't take it personally. Yes. Yes, sir. So actually in America right now, um, there's, some, there's some interesting surveys that show that political affiliation is actually more powerful um, than racial and, and so that there are more people who say, I do not want my son or daughter to marry someone from the other party and say, I don't want my son or daughter to marry someone across uh, a racial or color divide. Yes. Yes. And what I'm seeing is that for young American Jews, in order for them to gain citizenship within the progressive country, this progressive subcountry of the United States, they're allowed to be Jews. They're allowed to be religious Jews. They're allowed to be identified Jews, but they have to renounce Israel yes. in order to get citizenship. That's the cost. Look, it's a tragedy. But it also, it also speaks about ask yourself okay, you renounce Israel and you become a progressive Jew. But you already renounce religion, because to be progressive, you have to renounce religion. And you, when you're progressive, you also renounce your community, because you have a universal community. Basically, you dissipate. So if you want to dissipate, the Israelis say, dissipate. And then the debate goes on that Israelis, including our minister of education, said, you know, go to hell. In a different fashion, he says it. But basically, if you don't like us, if you think that in order to be Jewish you have to hate us, so be a Jewish anti-Semite, but don't come for my help. This is terrible if there is like that. This language, I think, is, is, is poisonous, is toxic on all sides. One has to take a step back and understand who is manipulating it, what needs to be done. There's lots of work to be done because the Jews, regardless of what you think about them, as there are many things to think about them, have survived 2,500, 3,000 years of life, more. I don't, I don't want to go to Jewish calendars right now, right? And there is something which is America celebrating, which is identity. To tell the Jews that only you cannot celebrate your identity is absolutely anti-Semitic in my opinion. But you have to hold your ground. And how you hold your ground is basically first identify what does it mean to be Jewish for you. So many American Jews come on birthright Israel to Israel. They come for two weeks tour in Israel as a silver bullet for Jewish identity. Suddenly they open their hearts and minds and say, wow, I have brothers and sisters here. It's not brothers and sisters that debunk my citizenship in America. But so are Latin Americans, so are African Americans who, who travel to South Africa and celebrate this kind of like, uh, 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 this, this achievement. It is part of America 
what we call to achieve uh, to celebrate the achievement of your people across frontiers. It doesn't mean that it comes at the expense of America. The demand of the Jews to do so, to celebrate, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely outrageous. I, again, I don't want to send you to read books, but I wrote the book Marketing the American Creed Abroad, how Americans relate to their countries of origin and diasporas, and I think this is a very, very, very alarming development. Now, it also relates, as you say, to politics in America. The Jews have moved away from what they call particularism, in certain, not the Jews, certain Jews, many Jews not, and into what they call tikkun olam. What's tikkun olam? Mending the world. Mending the world is universal creed. Obama was also saying, I'm doing tikkun olam. The big question is, when you do tikkun olam, does it have to be tikkun olam that has nothing to do with Jews, but it's a Jewish concept, it's kind of like, uh, 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 even, it's, 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 it's shop tights, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a concept that the reform debunk ones, but it's a kind of like a, a beautiful idea of mending the world universalism. How much universal you can be and be also a member of people. African Americans want to be African Americans for good reason. Spanish Americans don't want to, to give it their identity. Irish still celebrate Irish identity. It may be the case that the Jewish American, many of, many of whom, not all, many of whom say, okay, it's enough for me and they will assimilate. It happened. 70% of American Jews, in any case, marry intermarriages. I'm not criticizing. It's their way of life. You know, I come from a family like that. So it's, I understand it. But it's a choice. Being a member of a certain people, it's a choice. And America allows you this choice, whether you want to belong or you don't want to belong. As long as it's not being imposed on you to say, I cannot belong because if I belong, I belong to something which is unallowed. I think this is problematic. Yes, sir. Ah, five minutes? Okay, yeah. I thought you were asking questions. Okay. We don't have to, we don't have to exhaust the whole five if you don't have questions. Any questions? Okay, so I say thank you.